So if Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age, but it starts in midlife, then what happens in midlife to women and not to men, it could potentially explain the greater lifetime risk for Alzheimer's. And by doing a lot of tests and a lot of studies, we looked at everything. We looked at genetics. We looked at lifestyle. We looked at blood pressure, cholesterol, um, diabetes, insulin resistance. We looked at all the things that are known risk factors for Alzheimer's. And nothing really quite explained the difference in risk until we landed on menopause. Hey friends, welcome to The Good Life with Michelle Lamoureux, a show for women in midlife who want to live happier, healthier, and more meaningful lives. I'm your host, Michelle Lamoureux, a self-love coach and the author of Design a Life You Love. And together we're going to be doing just that. Each week I bring on world-class experts, best-selling authors, leading entrepreneurs, and also do solo casts with the intention of inviting you to get connected to what you really desire from your life. This show is produced with love every week. There's inspiration and actionable tips in every episode because I want to see women playing a starring role in their lives instead of living on the sidelines. Be sure to join the Good Life Community newsletter over at thegoodlifecoach.com for more inspiration and tips to live your best midlife. And make sure you're following the show on your favorite podcast player. I'm so glad that you're here. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Today we are joined by Dr. Lisa Moscone, who is the author of Menopause Brain, and you are in for such an empowering interview. Run, don't walk, and buy this book immediately. I just, you will understand when you pick it up. Um, Dr. Moscone is an associate professor of neuroscience and neurology and radiology at Weill Cornell and the director of the Alzheimer's prevention program at WCM New York Presbyterian Hospital. The program includes the Women's Brain Initiative, the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic, and the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinical Trials Unit. She holds a PhD degree in neuroscience and nuclear medicine from the University of Florence, Italy. A world-renowned neuroscientist, she's ranked among the top 1% of scientists over the past 20 years by official metrics and was listed as one of the 17 most influential living female scientist by the Times. She's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The XX Brain, and of the international bestseller, Brain Food, which have been translated into more than 15 languages. And Dr. Moscone's TED Talk, How Menopause Affects the Brain, has been viewed over 4 million times. Welcome, Dr. Moscone. What an honor to have you on today. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to, to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're in for a treat because I read your book and I my mind was blown. And the fact is we're going to be talking about our brain. So maybe that's why. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but before we start, I'd love to just start with your dedication. You write to all women, our ancestors, our descendants, and all of you blazing the trail with me as I speak. Um, tell us, I think a lot goes into a dedication and to reference ancestors and descendants. And having read the book, I I got a feeling of why that was important, but tell us more about why you dedicated the book the way that you did and how it informs the work you're doing. It really does inform my work because as a scientist, usually we're very focused on our own little thing. You know, we go very vertical, you know, really well this specific topic. But with the work I'm doing right now, which is menopause and women's brain health overall, I'm trying to to really go horizontal. And I want for my work to, I I would love for my work to have an impact on culture as well as science and, and health, which is something that as a scientist, really hard to accomplish. There are very few scientists who can really say, my work is helping individuals outside of academia and is having a direct impact on culture, on the way that we understand something, the way that we interpret something, on the way that we talk about something. Mm. And I'm hoping that the work we're doing right now at the Women's Brain Initiative, which is really my professional baby, if you will, might be supportive of women's health across the board. 
And we really stand on the shoulders of giants here because there are so many women who came before me for sure, who advocated for women's health and women's rights and really fought to make sure that we had access to higher education and to C-level positions even. Yes. And this book is really to honor all women, our ancestors who really made it possible for us to go through menopause and live long lives and live to old age, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute. But I also think this book overall is my personal love letter to womanhood. I love being a woman. I love women. I was raised in many ways by women. My dad is amazing. But, you know, it's really my grandma who was a little bit like the heart of the, of the home. And I just feel like that as women, we have been treated poorly. Yes. In medicine, science, yes. culture, society. And that it really, the more women stand up, for each other and support each other and encourage each other and empower each other. And the sooner we will see a meaningful change. So I'm hoping that my daughter and your daughter's generations will be past this stage, will have opportunities, will have solutions, and will not have to worry about many other things that we have to worry about right now. Yes. And I felt that it was a love letter. I felt that. I felt that in the in what you wrote and the way you structured the book and mm -hmm. just giving us the historical context, because I think without the historical context, we don't realize why we're in the situation we are today and why more research and funding needs to go to this. And the, the work that you're doing is so important and uh, needed right now because of <laughs> where we came from. Yes. I mean, it, it's it's this man. When you look at the, at the way that women's brains in particular have been treated. Yes. It's incredible. So medicine and, and science really did so much damage to the field, resulting in women's brain health being one of the most under-researched, under-treated, under-diagnosed, under-funded, and underserved fields of medicine. Yes. And you then look at menopause as part of women's brain health, which should be, then the situation is even more dire. And that's terrible because all women, God willing, will go through menopause at yes. some point in their lives. And women are half of the population, right? And yes. all have brains. And we just have no framework to address brain health during menopause. Yes. And thank you for writing this book because until I read your book, I didn't even realize it was a promise. Yes. I didn't know it was a problem. <laughs> I've had lots of gynecologists come on who've written books and they're amazing books and mm -hmm. my audience. And, you know, we all learn so much, but I had so many aha moments and we're going to dive into that in a second, but I, just out of curiosity, because I'm very curious about you, why did you focus on women's brain health? Was there a particular reason that you were directed into this path? You know, So this is interesting. So you mentioned that my PhD is from the University of Florence in yes. Italy. Yes. So I was born and raised in Florence, which is beautiful. Yes. And as everybody probably knows, Italians are very family oriented, right? Mm -hmm. So I live with my grand with my parents, but my grandparents live actually on the same landing. Like really, I could open the door and my grandma was right there. And my parents were working extremely hard and very long hours. My parents are nuclear physicists. Oh wow. <laughs> You've got some serious. I got it, You did, yes. Okay, wow. Okay. And they really, so my grandmother effectively would take care of me. Mm. Whenever my parents were working, which was very, very often, also weekends, they were working really around the clock back then. Yeah. But at the same time, their students will come over sometimes. That is normal in Italy, that when you are a professor at the university, especially in nuclear physics, which means that in total, maybe you have 30 students, maybe <laughs> at the most. <laughs> um, the students could use a little extra help because it's a very hard 
um, curriculum to go through. And so they will come over for some extra support and asking questions over the weekend. And they, mm-hmm. they babysit me. They would take turns working with my parents and then babysit me at the same time. And so I thought that the coolest thing in the world was to look at brains using radioactive isotopes and these scanner machines. So I always wanted to be a brain scientist. Wow. I think I was six when I was like, I'm going to do brain scans and I could really <laughs> use a scanner for my birthday or something like that. Uh, maybe eight, but young. Only then I started my PhD in neuroscience and nuclear medicine, which is exactly this is a fusion of nuclear physics and medicine wow. where you use radioactive isotopes to look at the brain. And mm-hmm. those are the images that we see all the time where some parts of the brain are blue and green and red. There's activation, but we're really looking at biochemistry or neurochemistry, which was my favorite subject always. When I was doing my PhD, my grandmother, started showing signs of cognitive decline and personality changes as mm. well, okay. which then progressed to a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And my grandmother was one of four siblings, mm. three sisters and one brother. And all three sisters developed Alzheimer's disease and died of it, whereas the brother did not, even though they all lived to the same age. Wow. Yes, they have very long lives, actually. My grandmother passed in her late 90s. Wow. But she had dementia for over 10 years. Okay. That was really hard, obviously, on her, but also on us. Yes. You know, in so many ways, not just the heartbreak, but also the practicalities of being the primary caregivers for a patient with dementia. Yes. Obviously, that's shocking on so many levels, including, is it genetic? You know, is my mom going to have dementia? Am I going to? Because that's really kind of the last thing I want. Pretty much. Yes. And so that was my question for my PhD thesis, for my doctorate degree, was about Alzheimer's disease and whether or not it runs in families. And if it does, how? And does it matter if you're a woman or a man? Is it just my family? Or is there a bigger lesson to be learned? Wow. And so I'll try to make this story a little bit shorter than it was for me. But back then, people would say to me, well, we've known since 1996 that I was, you know, young. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've known for, for a while that um, after aging itself, yes. being a woman, is the most significant risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Simply being born a woman is a major risk for developing dementia, but everybody thought it was because women live longer than men, right? If Alzheimer's disease is a disease of old age and women live longer than men, then unfortunately, at the end of the day, more women will have Alzheimer's disease, more women will end up with Alzheimer's disease, which never made sense to me. Because in reality, the longevity gap is only a couple of years. Right. Like here in the United States, women yes. outlive men by four and a half years. Yes. Not 10, not 20. They're right. just a few years. And also that's an average. But like in England, the difference is two years. Wow. In Alzheimer's disease and dementia is the number one cause of death for women and yeah. not for men. So there's something also if it was just aging then women would have also a higher risk of other age-related diseases like vascular dementia, right? Parkinson's disease with dementia. But that's not the case. It's 50-50. Or Parkinson is actually more frequent in men. So there seems to be something about Alzheimer's disease and being a woman that go hand in hand. And a lot of my career was really focused, and I'm getting to the book, I promise. (laughs) A lot of my work was focused at first to demonstrate that Alzheimer's disease in, is not a disease of old age. It's actually a disease of midlife that starts with negative changes in the brain that then accumulate over time, leading to an Alzheimer's diagnosis when you're in the sem- in your 70s or 80s. But the process starts in midlife. So Alzheimer's disease is a disease of middle age with symptoms that start in old age. This is now established. 
Everybody mm-hmm. agrees there's consensus in this. Yes. And that's changing the whole question then for me, right, right. about women. So if Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age, but it starts in midlife, then what happens in midlife to women and not to men, yes. it could potentially explain the greater lifetime risk for Alzheimer's. And by doing a lot of tests and a lot of studies, we looked at everything. We looked at genetics. We looked at lifestyle. We looked at blood pressure, cholesterol, um, diabetes, insulin resistance. We looked at all the things that are known risk factors for Alzheimer's. And nothing really quite explained the difference in risk until we landed on menopause. (laughs) Okay, we're going to have to... Not scare everybody because no, it doesn't mean it's a, right. Okay, yes, go ahead, go no. ahead, please. This is fascinating. What we, what we learned, yes, that menopause comes with a lot of changes, not just for the body, but yes. also in the brain. And for some women, not all women, for some women, these changes in hormonal concentration can make the brain more vulnerable to some medical predisposition. So let's say you have a predisposition to depression. Yes. You don't know that you have it, yes. but you have this predisposition. There's a strong chance that you may experience depression for the first time during menopause. Mm. You have a predisposition for multiple sclerosis. There's a chance that you may start experiencing the symptoms of multiple sclerosis or develop the changes in your brain as you go through menopause, because that's a that's a time where your brain is effectively a little bit vulnerable. Mm-hmm. For Alzheimer's disease, if you have a predisposition to Alzheimer's disease, there's a chance that we might start seeing the plaques, the Alzheimer's plaques in your brain as you go through menopause. Menopause is like, it's an activator for some women of medical predisposition, or more in general, is a time in a woman's life where the brain is going through a transformation and a transition and the symptoms are known. The half flashes, the night sweats, the insomnia, some mood changes, the brain fog, but there's also medical risks that become more evident at that stage in life. And I'm not saying that this is for, for every woman, Yes, but globally. Menopause is a transition point that comes with risks and vulnerabilities, but also with increased resilience and a lot of wonderful things that we can look forward to. And they know that we're going to explore explore both. Okay. This is so helpful. And also, was it 20% increased risk of Alzheimer's? I mean, is there a percentage in terms of women and their risk factors so that it, women don't think, okay, well, we're all going through menopause if I live long enough. Um, am I at, you know, what's my, you know, as a woman going through menopause, is there a percentage risk increase of having that pers- propensity to have that turned on for you, the predisposition? Gets right. turned so on. that depends on, um, on a number of factors, including your own genetic predisposition, your family history, other risks in your life, your lifestyle, your medical history. Overall, yes, a 50-year-old woman has a one in five chance of developing Alzheimer's later on in life, whereas a man of the same age has a one in 10. Okay. Developing so the risk is relative, yes, to men, but broadly, 20% of women develop Alzheimer's disease at some point in their lives. And 20%, in my opinion, is way too many. Agreed. And we're working to lower that number, of course, but it also says that 80% do not, right? So, exactly, the majority about, don't. The majority the don't. Majority That's the don't. Take majority That's, don't. Very yeah. important. However, if you're concerned, about your risk of Alzheimer's, then midlife is a wonderful time to start proactively thinking about lowering the risk. Yes. And now that we know that menopause is one of the pos- of the many possible factors that impact risk, yes. then it's a great time to address menopause, which is something that we can do. We know how to do it. Yes. Let's do it. Okay. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we can do and be proactive yes. about. So that's 
there will be actionable things you can so in case you're worried yes which is so i mean important. i wrote a whole book about what to do 100 <laughs> percent. that's why i'm saying run run yeah. don't walk go get the book because there's so you literally so many things that you list there's in there so, many. so, so many. many and all doable like all very yes. doable yes. um um so Let's talk about the brain implications. You named the book Menopause Brain for a reason. Um, I'm just going to read just briefly from something you actually posted on Instagram. And you said, what most women don't realize is that menopause features as many brain-borne neurological symptoms as bodily physical symptoms. A classic misconception is the nature of hot flashes, which are not skin glitches, but legit neurological events. And you listed some bodily symptoms and brain symptoms. And actually you listed, as you were explaining it, hot flashes, mood changes, like brain fog, um, depression, and some sleep disturbances. Um, so, and night sweats. So those are coming from the brain. I think this is, this is like a huge aha t- that yeah. I took away from the book. I was like, oh my goodness, this is brain stuff. This isn't just, you know, we think it's all coming from the ovaries, but I know you also talk about the ovary and brain connection. Yeah. I mean, they work together. Um, well, see- this is yeah. my problem as a brain specialist. Yes. There's this misconception that whatever happens in menopause is related to the function of the ovaries. And therefore, you need to go to an ob to have it yes. addressed. Yes. But in reality, that's only half of what menopause is all about. Because in reality, the most disruptive symptoms of menopause have nothing to do with the ovaries, but everything to do with the brain. The brain is actually driving the majority of the symptoms that women find so disruptive Mm. and really so quality of life changing during menopause. So as a society, we associate menopause with the function of the ovaries for good reason, because that's evidently what's happening, right? There's there's an obvious change (laughs) you can point out and kind of, you know, wonder about. But at the same time, there are changes that your brain is undergoing that you can't see but you can feel them. Mm-hmm. And those are reflected in what we call the symptoms of menopause and the menopause brain, which I think should be a legit category. Sorry. Yes. Yes, it should be. Like we have the mommy brain, right? We should totally. have the menopause brain. Yes. Because when women say that they're having hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, anxiety, depression, memory lapses, brain, brain fog, fog. That, that one. Right. I'm in perimenopause, but that one I'm experiencing. Around my yeah. menstrual cycle, uh, which is fairly yeah. regular, at almost 53, by the way. Uh, yes. Yeah. No, yeah. that can happen. And it's yeah. unsettling. And those are symptoms that do not come from the ovaries at all, mm. but are signs that your brain is undergoing a transition. So all those symptoms come from the ways that menopause changes the brain. And they're actually neurological symptoms. We're just not used to talking about them as such. And yeah. in men, there's no framework to characterize them as such. So the brain doctors are technically not allowed to manage menopause because right. there's no, it's not part of our scope of work. Right. And that is, I think it's a, it, it's a loss. It's, it's a complete missed opportunity. And I really strongly believe that women's health should be more integrated when, yes, you have the ob who are not trained to manage brain health, right? Yeah. Or incentive, they're not even technically, there's no CPT code for a menopause specialist to prescribe certain things that's related to brain health or neurological exams. And the other way around, that we are not supposed to be doing gynecological evaluations for a good reason. <laughs> Absolutely not, no argument. But Working together yes, would be a wonderful resource for women. So this is what we do at the Women's Brain Initiative and the Alzheimer's Prevention Program at WildConnect Medicine, which I launched. Yes. We work very, very tightly. <laughs> we work beautifully with the ob department so that we can triage with other departments as well and provide comprehensive care for our patients, that they're not unilateral. I'm not just going to look at your brain and check if you have a brain tumor, why matter lesions, malformation, mini strokes. We also want to make sure that we address your hormonal changes and we provide support from both sides. Fascinating. That's going to change 
the landscape. I mean, once, okay. so is it a st- like something I read like in 2025, some of the research is going to be out there or something on the, what you're working that, on? Yes, that is our new clinical trial that we just launched. So the clinic is open. Okay. And the Women's Brain Initiative is open. And okay. all the participants receive thorough evaluations, comprehensive evaluations that, if necessary, include the ob visits as well and counseling for menopause and hormone replacement therapy. If it's interesting to the participants, if it makes sense to discuss it. Then we have a clinical trial that I'm very excited about. We just launched it. It's an NIH-funded phase 2B randomized placebo-controlled parallel arms uh, clinical trial, which all comes down to a very thorough gold standard clinical trial of a novel estrogen formulation Mm. that very specifically supports brain health, but reduces the risk of cell proliferation in breast and uterine tissue. So there are no concerns about any risk of breast cancer or uterine cancer. I'm not saying that anybody should be concerned with regular HRT. Yes. And this is a different option that was specifically developed to boost brain health during menopause without having an impact on your reproductive system, which is something that many women want and some women really need because like breast cancer survivors are typically discouraged from taking the second generation of hormones, which is what we use clinically right now. So, yeah. That's really exciting. Yes, I was reading that. Okay, in the book. Okay, so this is really exciting. I think having some historical information, like understanding of how we got into this situation where we're un- under underfunded, under-researched, under-diagnosed, even the GYNs get four to eight hours of training. I mean, they're not even- trained. When they do, right? When it's they do, one right. in five. It's one in five residents in ob get trained in menopause care. So they don't even all get that eight hours. Okay. <laughs> so oh. your cha- first chapter is called, You Are Not Crazy. Yes. So, so I love that because- when I was reading about some of the history and this idea of quote unquote bikini medicine and how we look at the woman and how uh, things to Darwin, and you can tell us more about this, had um, doctors and men or everyone believing that women were inferior and, you know, setting us up to have really some horrible things done to women in the past who were going through menopause and treated as if they were just crazy and they were not just not taken care of, but they were harmed. I mean, some of the stuff that was done to them was just unconscionable. It just, like, I just can't even, yes, too much to think about. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the women have been nothing short of tortured. Thank you. Name of menopause and just for having a reproductive system. It's something that male physicians just cannot understand. And this goes back to ancient Greece. Right, I started like Hippocrates, the father yes. of medicine, had really harsh words about menopause and generally um, with female physiology. Like back then, they even came up with the word hysteria, which is from Greek and means uterus, to define this female-specific condition where you kind of go nuts when you have your menstrual cycle and then when you no longer have it. And even syndromes like the premenstrual syndrome, which is now, I wouldn't say it's fully accepted in medicine, but at least is recognized that there is thing as PMS. Like you won't find it in medical textbooks yet. But is that right? Talk- yes. That's not even in medical <laughs> textbooks? No, it's not formalized. It's not considered an act <laughs> diagnostic entity. I know. I know. Yeah. Well, if you think that postpartum depression was only formalized in 1994. And scary. yeah, I mean, it's incredible. The word hysteria was removed from diagnostic medical textbooks in 1980. You know, I mean. Wow, we are, we're moving way too slow. <laughs> yes, we're moving way too slow. And I, I like to say, 
I'd like to inform everyone that even though hormones like estrogen and progesterone were discovered in the 1930s, the fact that they have a function in your brain, yes. not just for the ovaries, was only discovered in 1996. Wow. Now, for context, we landed on the moon 30 years prior, right? So effectively, oh, we, know, we know more about space <laughs> than we know <laughs> about female physiology. It is baffling. And it's yeah. not like there's just a couple of women on the earth. We are half of the global population and all women, should they live long enough, but all women are 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 going to go through menopause. So it's not like something that happens occasionally to just a few select individuals. This is something that really impacts half of the world population and has an effect on, on the other half as well. So women of menopausal age, midlife women, are the fastest growing demographic population globally with a projected 1 billion by the year 2030, so in five years, six years, it's going to be 1 billion women who have just entered menopause or are about to enter menopause. Wow. It's a huge section of the population that most likely will approach this change with no support, no awareness, not knowing what hit them, and not knowing where to go for solutions. So I think it's really important that we start talking about this and that we clarify, we are not going insane. Society made us believe that menopause can render a woman medically insane, while at the same time making menopause of women invisible because of all the bias around ageism and sexism that really compound when it comes to menopause. And then that's it, we're gone. Nobody cares about your stories. There's no solutions in place. You're just in a position of green and bear it. But menopause can be an actual problem. You know, it's a very long, it can be a very long transition. It can range between two years and 14 with an average of seven in developed countries. So it's a, it's a significant amount of time in a woman's life. And then most women today spend at least one third of their entire lives in a postmenopausal stage. So it's important. It's a meaningful time in a woman's life that is shrouded in mystery and stigma, where there's no sense of, accompli of accomplishment of any sort. There's no sense of accomplishment. There's no sense of status gained. There's nothing to look forward to in Western countries. And this is such a pity, it's such a missed opportunity, and it's such a misconception that I think it's really important to address it and advocate for a change because this is this is this needs to be a rallying cry for all women to get together, embrace the fact that we do go through menopause, that it does not have to be a drag. There are solutions in place, we just don't know about them yet, right? When they're not being given to us for whatever reason, cultural and whatnot. And we can effectively enjoy the entirety, the entirety of our lifespans. Yes. Really have a productive, if not reproductive, rest of our lives that is just as beautiful as everything that came before. Okay. This is so important. And this is why I say, you know, read Dr. Moscone's book, listen to this podcast, share it with everyone, because I think the more informed education is power. And, you know, I think at some point you go into the doctor sometime and just, you start knowing more than they <laughs> do, which can be a problem, but also it can be empowering because then you know that you can find a provider that, because I actually feel very fortunate. I think my GYN, GYN is very up to date. Mine um, too. If anybody uh, wants a gynecologist in New York City, I have at least four very strong recommendations. Oh, well, can we, we'll list that in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to want to list that for sure, please, because I think getting the right care is so important, but also just understanding the historical context, where we are today and where we're trying to go. And 
the work that you're doing is in fact that not just it's a love letter and a legacy of empowering women so that our daughters aren't going through this. They're going to have a whole different experience. And we want to keep lifting the women up. Like as you started the interview with, like we're standing on the shoulders of the women that came before us. And so yeah. we want to lift our future generations up higher and to never have to, to be called crazy or dismissed or just, to yeah, gaslit. All the doctors that come on talk about the gaslighting that's happening. Gaslighting. And would you like a prescription for either antidepressants or psychotherapy? Right. Because that's, obviously you're crazy. Yeah, because obviously it's all in your Don't head. Don't bother us with it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares. It's going to... Nobody gonna cares. Change. This you too shall pass. Mm. I hate that. It, will, it shall pass when? You know, right, I want it to right. pass now. <laughs> right, right. It's not. We know. It's not right. Involved. It's not 14 involved. years of perimenopause. Yeah. Yes. yes, but we can do better than that. We can really do better than that. So. Well, tell us about HRT, because I think there's a lot of just confusion around it. Like, who's it for? Is it good? Is it bad? I know, um, I think I mentioned already, like, I, I am in perimenopause. I am getting a fairly regular period at almost 53. I know my mom had, you had written that our, what our mom went through and when is often indicative of what our experience will be, right? So yes. I think she was, I think, 57. So oh, I may be, nice. yeah, I know. So I think I'm yeah, going to be in this. If you ever would like a brain scan. Oh, it would you want to put me in part of your study? <laughs> I would like that. I would like that because, yes, I, I would be interested okay. in it. Let's in talk about it after. I'll do it. Age 53 is, is awesome. Yeah, so I, I'm getting, so I think, We'll see, I think, but anyway, but I am in, um, experiencing some symptoms. And for me, what I said to my gynecologist is my mom didn't really have many symptoms. I, oh, well, I think my, a lot of mine are more of like the brain ones, like, like I said, yes. the brain fog or like, you know, trying to even read your, in, your bio sometimes. And I find like the words tripping up and I'm like, oh gosh, you know, why is that happening to my mouth right now? Why can't I speak? <laughs> um, but see, I said to her, I want to protect my brain. So if yes. there's data that this is going to protect my brain, then I'm more interested. But, you know, I'd like to just get your input as as someone who studies women's brain health and what we yes. know based on the science. Yes. So hormone replacement therapy is one of the most confusing fields of medicine that I have ever come across. Okay. Um, so that makes sense that we're confused because yeah. you're a neuroscientist studying women's brain health and you find it. <laughs> I find it very confusing. Okay. I find that the body of knowledge that we have comes from studies that are done in many different ways. So it's very hard to integrate across studies because they're very heterogeneous. Okay. And they look at different aspects of HRD. I'm going to try and really summarize it as best I can, but we could talk about this for hours. No, I know. Yeah. Okay. And you you go into it in the book too, in terms of who's a candidate yeah. and if you have breast cancer and all yeah. of that. What so. do you do if you have breast cancer? Yeah. So number one, something that most people don't realize is that there are many different types of hormones that you can take. Yes. That usually comes as a surprise. So we we tend to talk about estrogen as the one hormone that we want to replace. Yes. But what happens in reality is that it depends. The choice depends on whether or not you have a uterus. Most women do, but many women do not because of hysterectomies and oophorectomies, which is the surgical removal of the uterus with or without the ovaries, right? Yes. So, so there can be a partial hysterectomy when only the uterus is removed, but the ovaries are preserved. Okay. There can be a full hysterectomy when the entire organ is removed, ovaries included, there can be an oophorectomy, which is when the ovaries are removed, but the uterus is not. The endometrium okay. is still there. The tubes are still there. There could be a BSO where the ovaries are removed along with other parts of the reproductive system. So there are many different options out there. But here's the important thing. If you have a uterus, you need to take the estrogen together with the progesterone. If you don't have a uterus, then you can take estrogen alone. 
Okay. There. there are many different types of estrogen formulations and progestogenic formulations. So estrogen, at least here in the United States, is delivered mostly in two forms. So historically, um, it was conjugated equine estrogens or CEDs. Then the other one is what people refer to as bioidentical estrogen. Yeah. The technical term is micronized estradiol. Okay. So yeah. those are the two estrogens that are most consistently used. And there is a tendency right now to go towards to use more the bioidentical micronized estradiol preferentially overseas. Progestins or progestogens are complicated because there are so many. So when we talk about bioidentical progesterone, yes. we're talking about micronized progesterone, which is a basically molecular replica of the hormone that your ovaries make. But in reality, the vast, a lot of women, if not most women, at least until a few years ago, were not put on micronized progesterone, but on a synthetic progestin. Oh. Yes, they come with many different names. MPA is the one that created potentially a lot of trouble two decades ago with, with the Women's Health Initiative. Um, th there are a lot of different formulations. Now, synthetic progest progestogens or progestins yes. have linked possibly with a slightly higher risk of breast cancer for women with a predisposition to breast cancer. Okay. Okay. So... I think the overall message at this time is that estrogen therapy, with or without a progesterone, can be quite effective to relieve vasomotor symptoms, which are hot flashes and night sweats. Yes. Um, the urinary symptoms of menopause, genital urinary, like vaginal dryness, pain with intercourse, can really help in that respect as well can help with um, certain aspects of sleep, especially during the perimenopausal transition. I'm giving you on-labels and off-labels indications all at once. Yes. Um, because I think we're going to potentially expand in a few years to also include more indications. It may help with depressive symptoms, especially during perimenopause, provided that the symptoms are hormonal in nature. Right. So yes, you're having the press symptoms because of your hormones changing. Right. Then it surely can help. Yes. You're having depressive symptoms for other reasons. Obviously, that needs to be worked out up front before anyone has been put on hormones. And it may also help with brain fog, at least for some women. I think we need more research on that. Actually, we have a paper. Um, and the review that I'm hoping will be published soon, showing a very specific effect of estrogen therapy and estrogen progesterone therapy on cognitive function. This is a, the largest, I believe, meta-analysis to date. So it's an integrated view of all the different studies that have been published so far. So we can get a really good sense of what hormones can and cannot do for you from a cognitive performance perspective. And at least... What I can tell you, pending peer review, although the comments were positive so far, um, is that estrogen therapy seems to help with some aspects of brain fog and memory, especially for women who had a hysterectomy, which is very important because those women are also at higher risk for neurological changes and potentially for a higher risk of dementia later on in life. Mm. So this is something that is very important to know. Okay. Um, I don't know where you are on the path, but is, would you, are you considering HRT for yourself? I mean, is that too no. personal to ask? No, no, that, no. If I'm, yeah, yeah, I don't want to get too personal, but I'm just curious because uh -huh. I don't like to take anything unless I need it. And my body, re I'm very sensitive to medication. So I have a feeling I might be one of those people who's not a candidate, but I will want to try it if it's going to protect my brains, my bones, my heart and all that stuff. So I'm just curious. Absolutely. This is something my husband asks me all the time. But when yeah. you start going through my yeah, like, yeah. Are, are you, are you, because a lot of the docs are like, I'm going to be on it for life. Like they are sold, you know, but I don't know if the day, <laughs> the science is there yet about how yeah. 
protective it is once you're a certain few years out of, you know, you've mm-hmm. gone through the transition. So I don't know. Yeah, for me, I'm premenopausal. I'm not okay. premenopausal, not yeah. perimenopausal. No, okay. no. Very yeah. Okay. But this is a great time to actually start thinking about options and preparing for the transition. Yeah. So I, right now, I'm really very disciplined with my lifestyle because there are a lot of things that one can do to really have a good baseline, a solid starting point and engage in a lot of different lifestyle practices that have been shown to really help with the symptoms of menopause. So I'm starting with that because I can't take hormones even if I wanted to, which right. I don't. As I go through menopause, then I think it depends. It depends on symptoms of whether or not you're having a hard time during menopause. If I do have a hard time, I would consider taking hormones, yes. yes. No, I, I can't. Everything I do depends on my brain. I need to be sharp. I need to be alert. I can't have mental fatigue, which is what we call brain fog, right? I just can't yes. to have cognitive fatigue. I don't want to have cognitive fatigue. <laughs> And there's also, um, at least my research, which needs to be replicated, confirmed, we need more work, da 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 But my research shows that estrogen is protective against age-related diseases like Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So I want yes. to see more evidence, yes. and then we to generate the evidence that I want, right? So I'm, I'm fortunate in that respect. But I think if I, I have a uterus, If I didn't have a uterus, I would take hormones if I was eligible to do that. Yeah. You're going to hedge your bets because of the protective, some, some the protective effects of estrogen seem to be clearer and more consistent for women who had their uterus removed either with or without the ovaries. Okay. Yes. So in that case, I believe there is enough biological plausibility and also current recommendations of professional societies really support the use of estrogen therapy for women who had a hysterectomy before menopause, because that seems to be helpful to reduce the risk of osteoporosis, of depression, of anxiety, of cardiovascular uh, risk, and potentially, potentially also cognitive decline later on in life. Okay. And of course, it makes the have flashes better, it supports sleep. So that's that's quite a consistent finding that is also supported by professional societies. So I think it's really important to know that. So let me say this differently. This is this is another example of how medicine has not been serving women well. Right. Historically, if a woman was going to the surgeon to have her uterus removed, the recommendation was to also take the ovaries out, regardless of whether or not the ovaries were affected. So there are a lot of women who go to their doctors because they need to have a hysterectomy for whatever reason. It could be uterine cancer, it could be fibroids, it could be endometriosis. Is there any indication where it is recommended that you undergo surgery and remove the uterus? Very often, there's no need to take the ovaries out, right? If the ovaries are not affected, if the ovaries are not sick, if you don't have ovarian cancer or any reason, any medical reason to have the ovaries out, why would you do that? So historically, it was common practice to say it's a cleaner surgery. If you don't want to have children anymore, let's just take everything out. Mm. It reduces the risk of you having to come back for more surgeries later, later on, but also really it brings your risk of ovarian cancer down to zero. Yeah. So if you're a surgeon, that makes complete sense. Yeah. If you have a brain person in there, they would tell you, well, the risk of ovarian cancer is very low. It's, it's rare. Ovarian cancer is terrible. It's a terrible disease, but it is rare or rarer as compared to heart disease which is the number one Mm -hmm. cause of death for women at this point is, you know, it doesn't happen nearly as often as dementia, for instance, or depression or anxiety or a mood disorder, which are all things that can happen to you 
when you go to menopause prematurely because of the surgery. So let's start weighing the risk and benefits yeah. of this surgery because yes, yeah. you optimize for the surgery for ovarian cancer, but you're not considering what actually what this surgery actually means when you look at the big picture for a woman's health. So it is upsetting that that was practice, that was common practice, because still today, of all the women who go for a hysterectomy, women who are like 40, 40 to maybe 50 years of age, a solid 44% still today in the United States have their ovaries out without needing to. Yes. That's so, such a disservice. And so the ovaries... <laughs> in the connection with the brain, I just, I just remember reading something in the book about the estradiol when you're going through menopause that the brain isn't getting that as much in the, is it the estrone or something? One another, one other, the estrogen starts sort of becoming the primary source of fuel for the brain. So the, there, yeah. So tell us what the connection is with the ovaries and yeah, the brain. So from the moment we're born, our yeah. brains are in constant communication with the ovaries because there's okay. a system that connects the two, that's called the neuroendocrine system. Okay. So this system is activated during puberty and is partially deactivated after menopause. And is that, think about it as a highway that connects your brain to your ovaries. It's beautiful. Yes, it's beautiful. It is. And passengers that go up and down the highway are your hormones. Okay. So sex hormones, there are many different sex hormones. We're talking about estrogen. Estrogen um, is actually estrogens plural, is a class of hormones, and the three main estrogens in women's bodies are estradiol, estrone, and estriol. Mm -hmm. so estriol, we're going to get rid of it right away, is the type of estro estrogen that we only make when we're pregnant. Okay. Yes. At, at any other time in your life, you're going to have very little to no estriol. Okay. But it's a very potent type of estrogen when you have it. The rest of your life, you're going to have predominantly estradiol for as long as you have a menstrual cycle and very little estrone. After menopause, then the proportion switches. So you have just a teeny tiny little bit of estradiol and more estrone. Mm -hmm. Because estradiol is made by the ovaries predominantly, estrone is made from body fat which is also one reason that as women go through menopause, many report building a little bit more fat tissue around yes. the women, specifically, which is frustrating for many, but there's a good biological reason for that, which is that that's really your body's reserve of estrogen after menopause. Okay. So it's important to have it. You don't okay. want to have too much, of course, because that leads to different health considerations, but some is actually really good for you. Okay. Um, currently, we're going to our GYNs for recommendations. At some point, hopefully it will be integrated with neuroscientists or people who study- Or neurologists. I was a neurologist. Neurologist. Yeah. Yes. Neuroscientists and... do the research, hopefully, that then we provide to the physicians to make their recommendations. And Yes. Yeah. Let's talk actionable things women can do. You mentioned lifestyle and things that you're doing preventatively now in pre, you're not perimenopausal, you're premenopausal. So yeah. you've you've got time and you're <laughs> you're you're focusing on lifestyle and prioritizing yeah. it. So talk to us about you you list so many in the book, but give us two of your favorites yes. um, to to focus on. Yes, and I will tell you that my husband thinks I'm mad. <laughs> Because we kind of switched a few things in our lifestyle to okay. accommodate my preparation for menopause. But so I am very regimented, I have to tell you. I'm, I'm very, very disciplined. So half of my family has a PhD. The other half is in the army. Okay. <laughs> we are very <laughs> determined. That's not hard for you then. Discipline's not something you struggle with. <laughs> no, it's not. I just need yeah. to remember myself sometimes so that I'm usually quite good so my my diet and nutrition has been elevated in my opinion and so has my exercise routine and I will say this in favor of exercise okay there are three types of exercise that help with specific types of symptoms as women go through menopause so aerobic 
exercise, cardio, yes. yeah, really helpful for temperature regulation, mm. half flashes, night sweats, and also for cognitive performance, brain fog. Okay. So if anyone has these symptoms, then it is helpful to do a little bit of cardiovascular activity or maybe a little bit more than just a little bit, but consider including that in okay. your exercise plan. It doesn't have to be strenuous. I'm not saying you have to run a marathon or doing spinning or anything, but just something that increases your heart rate a little bit. Yes. I've been told that athletes call it zone two. Yes. Or moderate intensity exercise. Yes. I've been you, hearing a lot about zone two. I didn't know what that meant. So that's what it is. That's what it is. It is what it is. It's basically when your heart rate is a little bit increased, but still comfortable. Okay. So you can talk, you can have a conversation, but you would be challenged to, for instance, like sing. Okay. Singing would be a little bit too much. Yes. Talking is doable. That's broadly zone two. And okay. please, this is an oversimplification, but this is how <laughs> it's mean by, yes, by actual professional athletes. So cardio for heart flashes and brain fog and memory lapses. Strength training for mood mm. and metabolic power, metabolic activity to maintain muscle mass, of course, as well, which is in turn very important to maintain a healthy metabolism and burn those calories as well. Yes. But for mood, it seems to be really uplifting and helpful for women who experience depression and anxiety during menopause. Okay. And then there's flexibility and balance, like yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, that is really good for stress reduction, but also for sleep. Hmm. So I think a combination, if you have the time, of course, which I know is a luxury, but if it's possible to kind of tailor your exercise routine to your own needs, that might be helpful as one goes through menopause or prepares for it. So in preparation for this, I bought a Pilates reformer. Oh, you did? I did. I am. I love it. I've been doing Pilates now three times a week. And then I do cardio twice a week and they do yoga often because they like it very, and, very much. And weights or is the... But the Pilates reformer actually gives That's you all the, the strength. Yeah, there's resistance because you have, it depends on the strings. Sorry, yeah. on the strings. You can set it on very gentle or you can really give yourself a good workout. Okay. It's hard. Sometimes it could be quite hard to... And then, yes, if I had more time, I would also do more specific strength training, but I don't, I just don't. So I do my best. I mean, that sounds great to me. And I know you're disciplined and structured. So tell us, I know Mediterranean diet is recommended, but including more like avocados and some things that may not be in the <laughs> traditional, but what are you eating for breakfast every day? <laughs> what do I eat for breakfast every day? So, well, okay. So I have been a vegetarian for most of my adult life. Okay. I'm not saying that anybody else should do it. I'm just telling you because there won't be any meat throughout my day. But, you know, I am yes. yes. completely agree that everybody eats the way they want and that works for them. So yes. for me, breakfast is specific. So I, um, well, I, I drink water as soon as I wake up. I believe that the Dehydration is really an issue for your brain and for the rest of your body. So I'm constantly very well hydrated. Can I ask so, what kind of water you drink? Because you talked about it needs to be like, we're drinking too many things from plastic bottles. So how do we get away from that? What do you do? We in the house. In your water system, you have a water filter in your home. So you're drinking yeah. right from the, the filter. And the, yes. Yeah. And we can drink uh, tap water that is actually yeah. clean. But so, you're avoiding the plastics on purpose? or uh, So this is another thing that I have changed. Uh, there's no plastic in my kitchen. Okay. Like none. Yeah. There's, I mean, some, um, when you have those glass containers that you have the lead, the kind of yeah. thing. That's plastic. The That's Pyrex, the yeah, I know. Yes. Yeah. But I never heat it up. It just goes in the fridge. Yep, I understand. Never heat plastic. Yeah. Of that source that is really not. A great idea. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so we have um, water. Yes. If you drink filtered water, that's totally fine. Purified water is not water. That's important to realize. Purified water is just fluids. 
it does not contain any of the minerals and salts and electrolytes that your body and brain need to be hydrated. Okay. So it gives you volume, but it does not give you the nutrition that your body needs to be effectively hydrated. That's important. That's okay. important. Yeah, same for seltzer. Yeah, it's just not water. Your brain doesn't just need something wet. It needs the minerals and salts that real water contains. Okay. So sometimes I treat myself to spring water. <laughs> <laughs> Aquafana is my favorite. It's what I grew up drinking. Yeah, so I like that water. It tastes good. Yeah. So then I go downstairs and it's quite early in the morning, but I go downstairs, I turn on the kitchen and I make lemon uh, tea for myself. Mm. So it's the juice of a lemon with warm water, not hot, because vitamin C is very easily damaged by heat. Mm. And I drink like this cup, actually. That's such a pretty cup. Yes. It's, it's a, well, it's also big. It's a solid 13 ounces. Okay. That goes down first on an empty stomach with probiotic supplements because gut health is also brain health. It's yes. important to take care of your microbiome. And then I make breakfast for me and for my daughter. We had breakfast together. She eats, like her breakfast is like a feast. <laughs> I'm trying to be careful. So I usually have a smoothie in the morning. And my favorite smoothie is, I so what I try to do is to increase the antioxidants in my diet. There's a lot of, a lot of evidence, which I also shared in the book, that antioxidant nutrients are really, really important, not just for brain health, but also for ovarian health. Mm. The brain and the ovaries are the only two organs in the body where specific cells do not regenerate. Fascinating. There's another connection between the brain and the ovaries. So everywhere else in the brain your cells are constantly renewed, right? We lose hair every day. Everywhere else in the body, you mean? So everywhere in the body, cells are renewed, but in the brain, it's the same cells the you're born with. Yeah. Yes, same in the ovaries. You're born with a specific number of follicles. Wow. Cells, but you don't keep growing them over time. So you really need to protect them. Mm. And what, what damages these neurons or ovarian cells most is oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is something that you either inflict upon yourselves by doing yes. certain things with your lifestyle, like smoking, or is something, and is something that also just happens naturally with the aging process. And the only way that we have to reduce oxidative stress is to import antioxidants from mm. the environment, which means from the diet. Okay. Yes. So plants, plant-based foods are the best source of antioxidants out there. Yes. So I try to focus on fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds. And I have no problems with grains, so also grains and legumes that contain antioxidants. So there's a lot of those in my diet right now. Okay. I mean, and that's in your smoothie too. So what's your yeah, smoothie? That's in my smoothie. Maybe so my can... favorite in... Yeah. I'm happy to share my favorite is we have two depending on what my daughter wants. That are our favorite. The first one for me is one mandarin or half of an orange with wild blueberries, mango, cilantro, a little bit of banana because my daughter loves banana, a protein powder that I really like that um, I have no conflicts of interest. It's I, I don't even know them. The tell us is, which one it is because I'm always yeah. looking for one. Yeah, tell us, tell us. It's Saqqara, Saqqara Life. Saqqara Life, you like that one? It's the only one I like. Okay. It's the only one that doesn't give me a stomachache. And it comes from seeds. So oh. it's not synthetic. It's, it's actually, I believe it's pulverized sunflower seeds and peas and stuff like that. So I put that in the smoothie and then I blend with coconut water. Mm. It's delicious. You have to try it. I'm going to try it. I'm going to go. It's really, yummy. really yummy. Yes. And my daughter's favorite is a green smoothie with a lot of spinach, baby spinach, mango, banana, a medjool date, flax seeds, lemon peel. Delicious. It's delicious. And then I blend it with soy milk. Okay, so you don't give her the protein powder at her age, at eight, no protein no, powder? No, not to yeah. her. That's but what the I thought. soy milk is actually has some the protein. protein. That's what I was wondering. Okay. It's unsweetened, unflavored, organic. So 
either. Right. So she loves it. I, I like it. I like the other one better. But yeah, both. yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that you have your little breakfast together. We've covered so much. I mean, honestly, I could just, we could just go five hours. I would just like, there's so much to cover, but <laughs> everyone's going to go buy the book. You cover everything in the book, the nutrition, the lifestyle, exercises, supplements, HRT. I mean, you cover everything. So I think understanding the brain connection is so key, but is there anything that I didn't ask you that you're like, you know what? I really want to make sure Michelle's audience takes away from this conversation today. Yes. I would say that, you know, women have been taught to really fear their hormones and doubt their brains. We've been put in this situation, we did not ask for it, but we're kind of in this place where our needs are not met. And more often than not, when you go to your doctor with a concern, you may be dismissed. So what I really want everybody to realize is that we have the information, right? We can share this knowledge, we can support each other and empower each other to really stand up for ourselves and not take no for an answer. Right? We we 100%. can do it. There's nothing to be feared about menopause. Yes. There are pros and cons to everything, and both are parts of being born with ovaries, I have to say. Yes. And I would like every I think I would really encourage everyone to think of menopause not as an alien event, but as something you've seen before. And minimum with puberty, right? It's the same system that connects your brain with your ovaries. And we all know that as we go through puberty, our mood changes, our sleep changes. Our temperature changes, they get a lot warmer, if nothing else. Our skin changes, everything changes in ways that are not that different from what happens in menopause. And the same thing is in pregnancy. It's the same system that gets overactivated during pregnancy and then crashes at postpartum after the baby is born. Yes. We have seen those changes. 30% of all pregnant women have half flashes. We just don't talk about it. Yeah. Many women who go through pregnancy experience depressive symptoms. There's yeah. a chance you may get them again in menopause. You yes. know, so nothing as think of, yes, like you said before, your mom is probably the best predictor of what your own menopause may be, but also you are. What, how was your puberty, right? What happened to you when you were an adolescent as you were going through puberty did you have any mood changes did you have any issues with concentration or attention or brain fog did you have issues with sleep that will give you a sense of how your own system responds to hormonal changes and then again in pregnancy did you have depressive symptoms did you have brain fog were you kind of spaced you have the mommy brain right that will give you a sense of what your menopause may be like. And if you think about it that way, then it's not scary anymore. It's just one phase, one more phase in your reproductive life. And it's right. part of you, which I think is the most important thing. It, it's your it's your body. Your body loves you. Mm. That's the most important thing. Your brain loves you. Your body loves you. They're both working tirelessly to make you thrive. So what we can do in return is to really take good care of our bodies and brains so that they can just do so much better and perform so much better for us, really for, for a lifetime of use. Love it. I've loved this conversation and for sure this menopause transition is in fact a celebration, an opportunity. An opportunity. So many women, you know, including even just, I haven't gone through it yet, but just even being in my fifties, just feel a sense of just having our voice again or yes. caring less. I mean, you're going through so many good things too. And you talk about that in the book. So thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for writing this book so that we can get educated, um, share this conversation with everyone and get the book. Um, where do I direct everyone, Dr. Moscone, to your website? What's the best place? My website is is a good source. It's Lisa Moscone, M O S C O N I dot com. All my books are on the website, so it's easy access. We also have a dedicated website, which is themenopausebrain dot com. It's easy to find. And for anyone who's interested in reading the book, then Amazon or any online retailers. It's it's a little bit everywhere, and it launches March twelfth. 
Perfect. And also what I've discovered too, just for simplicity, I, I was directing everyone to the goodlifecoach.com to the show notes. But if you look at your podcast player now, like on Apple Podcasts and scroll down, you're going to see all these links literally available, including a link to Dr. Moscone's book. And you can just click on that and it's going to take you right there to buy it. So um, share this. We need to be empowered. Information is power. And the work that you're doing is so appreciated. Uh, you're so lovely. I've admired you for so long. So this is such an honor to be sitting with you today. And um, I appreciate you and all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me and for helping us spread the voice and raise awareness. Really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you gain some new information or inspiration for your life. That is that the essence of this show is to really wake up to what's possible for you to reclaim your beautiful voice and to really learn to love and prioritize yourself. So if you gained any value from any of the conversations you've tuned into, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can do that right now on your phone. And please do consider leaving a rating and review if you have yet to do so on Apple Podcasts. It's actually how more women can find the show. And I really want to grow a community of women who are loving themselves and living full on. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I look forward to reconnecting with you next Wednesday. Bye for now. This podcast is presented for entertainment and educational purposes only. Any information provided is not intended to be a substitute for medical, mental health, or other professional advice. Seek out your trusted healthcare provider or other qualified professional for all matters dealing with your health and well-being. Any opinions or information provided by a guest are their own and not those of Michelle Lamoureux or the company.